we have we have Mercy Street as kind of a modern example of like Civil War medicine, but it seems also kind of when you look at the ongoing debates that you have with Veterans Affairs these days, and mm -hmm. I'm always reminded that in 2016, it wasn't the campaigns, the current incumbent of the White House made the comments that all these soldiers suffering from PTSD, it's just, they can't handle it. Yeah. And can't handle war. And it's, it feels like that there's still a significant amount of people out there that when an injury is invisible, whether that is psychologically or if that's actually a bodily injury, that there's still a certain dismissal that only the person that actually has a visible injury can be perceived of as a injured veteran. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even more recently, just over the winter, um, the, the, the president made a comment about um, traumatic brain injuries mm -hmm. Yes. And, and kind of dismissed Headache. them as being just headaches, right? Yeah. Um, and I found that very striking because it is, it comes back down to this kind of difficulty that we have to perceive of disability um, that isn't visible as real, mm -hmm. right? Because we're, the disability in general is so stigmatized and has been since well before the Civil War, right? That we are kind of, we've, we've, per, we've come to terms with accepting disability that we can easily understand. Mm -hmm. And usually that means disabilities that are visible. Yeah. Um, but even now, there is, you know, we still really struggle with disabilities that are invisible. I mean, I, every time I go someplace to talk about this, someone tells me a story about themselves or someone that they knew um, who parked in a, um, in a handicap mm -hmm. spot and put up their handicap tag yeah. and walked into the store and had someone say like, well, you can't use that because you're walking, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, because we believe that if you are truly disabled, then you can't walk mm -hmm. or you can't see or you can't hear or, you know, whatever it is. It, it should be it obvious be and apparent. Yeah, it has to be readily apparent to us. Mm -hmm. and, and by us, I mean non-disabled people, yeah. right? Like non-disabled people are, are the ones who have these assumptions. Um, and we often are quick to use those assumptions to strip disabled people of both their power in determining whether, you know, identifying themselves as disabled or not. Mm -hmm. We say, well, no, you don't actually have the authority to make that decision. It's the doctor, it's the judge, it's whoever. Um, it's the government in terms of support, right? But also in, in stripping them of benefits. Yep. Um, this is a story that I tell all the time. So he, he is aware that I, that I tell this wherever I go. But my husband is a workers' compensation attorney. Mm. And he, every single day, works to take away <laughs> benefits from right. people who have been hurt at work because he defends the, 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 the businesses, right. the corporations. Um, and I promise he's not like a Batman villain. I, I always make him sound like he's like evil or something, but it just happens. It's a very strange circumstance that this is disability historian married the, you know, workers comp. Um, makes for great villain. conversations. It does. It makes for very good additions to talks. That's how I'll say that. That's you. Um, and, you know, he tells me stories all the time about how, you know, workers' comp relies on the exact same systems that were used in the pension system, right? Mm. That things like surveillance. Yeah. Somebody claims that they're disabled, well, they will have someone surveil them mm -hmm. and take video of them loading mulch into the back of their van right. at yeah. Home Depot and say, not actually yeah. disabled. Yeah. And I think you when, have a great you know, story of the guy that goes home and walks, even though he's like disabled or tries yeah. to claim disability in the book, which was fascinating to see. Right. Yeah. How the, the you know, pension bureau actually sent out people to follow him, special investigators. Right. Um, that's how invested we are in mm -hmm. the idea that disabled people are somehow out to get us. They're, they're trying to, they're trying to bilk us somehow. They're trying to trick us. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to unveil that. Um, yeah, and it's, it's still, it's, 
very much still something that we deal with today. And, and you know, I, the president has made many comments about, yeah. about this, um, particularly around veterans and, and what this he is thinks. Um, <laughs> it is kind of odd, right? Because we are much more accustomed to, you know, politicians um, being, I mean, almost in a way, waving the bloody shirt, right? Yeah. Kind yeah. of trying to make political hay of veterans' issues. Yeah. And this president is, is certainly does that to a certain extent, right? He's very nationalistic in many ways, but mm -hmm. at the same time, very quick to, to state what he thinks is and isn't masculine for right. a veteran to do yeah. or to experience or to, you know, right? He, he's, I find him very similar to Grover Cleveland in some yeah, ways. I thinking where he mentions that, where you had these pension bills that Cleveland veto, these private personal pension bills that Cleveland right. veto, I think it was like five or six that you mentioned in the book. Yeah. And I go, today that's just unthinkable that you would have somebody so publicly take pensions away from a veteran, but here was Cleveland, it just happened. <laughs> yeah, Cleveland was, he made no bones about his, his hatred of the pension system and his belief that he was, as president, I mean, he has the power of the veto, right? You can't argue that. Um, and that he could use it to adjudicate which veterans deserved pensions and which ones didn't, right? And that was his, that was his right. And he was not going to apologize for it, um, which was just kind of Cleveland in general. Right, like he was yeah. an unapologetic man, um, but I, I think that it's it's a fascinating comparison. Not to say mm -hmm. that they're exactly the same or anything, but that, I mean, Cleveland was a, a man who bought his way out of Civil War service with mm -hmm. a substitute. Um, did not serve. We know, of course, that you know Donald Trump also did not serve in Vietnam. Not saying that he had to, but you know, yeah. um, but he didn't. And both feel very comfortable telling people who did serve in wars yeah. how they should behave afterwards, right? And, and what, what it really means to be an appropriately masculine veteran yeah. of the United States. Um, and I, I find that really interesting. Yeah. It, and it's not a comparison that you usually hear or think about. Because, I mean, the yeah. Gilded Age presidents are people we're not really <laughs> thinking about in general. And right can't even name them, but here it's sort of like, this is a different comparison where it's like, yes, it makes a lot of sense right now to make comparison maybe Trump Hoover, but right. um, Cleveland, considering there also was a economic downturn during his presidency, Certainly. so this may actually be for future scholars something worth looking at. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, it makes for an interesting counter narrative here in Buffalo because Grover Cleveland is proud son of Buffalo. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so people here are like, hmm, I'm not so sure. Yeah. <laughs>